Um, so welcome everyone. Thank you very much for coming this morning. And uh, before we kick off our presentation, Diana has a question for the audience. Yes. Um, can you hear me? I don't know if my mic is on. No, my mic is on. Thank you. Um, good. Whom of you has worked in a toxic environment before? Surprise! Yeah, it's almost <laughs> universal. Yes, okay, so uh, we, are, we are hoping that today we can uh, come away with some lessons learned and effective techniques for making sure that if you're working in one of those toxic environments, you can help to make it better or find your way out quickly. <laughs> yes, so we met a few years before and uh, of course we had some stories to share, especially about toxic environments and working in toxic environments. And so we thought we need to give a talk about empathy and how to, how to interact with other people, other humans better. And uh, that's how we came up with cultivating empathy. And uh, one of the things that I have found personally very gratifying in the area of empathy in our uh, work environments, be that at our companies or projects or even within our own family dynamics, is this conversation has sort of taken a center stage of late as ways that we can make software development better and open source better. So once upon a time, I think we felt like, you know, uh, there are folks over here doing coding, they're all very logical, that squishy human stuff is not really their purview, and you know, maybe you have the, the nice people over here who are your community managers, and they deal with all the squishy human bits. But if there's anything that uh, our current times have taught us, it's that we all need to be able to effectively communicate with one another in order to bring about positive change. So again, we're hoping that we can give you some concrete actions that you can take to uh, improve your life in your community, at your company, and just generally when interacting with other people so that everyone has a more positive experience. Yeah. So let's introduce ourselves because we are talking here and maybe you don't know us. So Leslie has been working in open source communities for over 12 years. Her past projects include Google Summer of Code and she is actually the creator of Google Code In. And she's uh, living the life of uh, an expat here in Europe. But of course, Berlin is her favorite city. It really is. I keep trying to get my husband to move here, and uh, I haven't convinced him yet. Uh, his family is from Stuttgart, so he, of course, thinks we should be living in the South. I may disagree, but that's an opportunity for me to exercise my empathy. Uh, my dear friend Diana, who is the godmother of my lovely little daughter, has been an active participant in the Ruby community here in Berlin for a long time. She's an organizer, a past organizer of the Rails Girls Berlin workshops, former board member of Ruby EV, and she's the community manager for the Go to Berlin conference. Have any of you folks in the audience had the opportunity to attend? Yay! Excellent. Thank you. <laughs> Very nice to see you here, and uh, I hope that uh, Diana will get to see you folks again in the Go to Berlin community. Yes. All right, let's start. So, why empathy matters. Um, for someone like me who tends to think of themselves as very empathetic, I find myself uh, not asking this question very often because to me it is just a self-evident truth that empathy is vital for all of our interactions. But that's not necessarily the case for everyone. Um, first of all, just to define empathy, empathy is the ability to, um, the idiomatic phrase is to put yourself into someone else's shoes, to really be able to understand another person's point of view to the point where you can, can internalize it and almost viscerally feel it. So if someone else is feeling disappointment, you too can have that same empathetic reaction in your body and in your mind. And this differs from sympathy, which is when we have concern for another person's problems, but it doesn't necessarily impact us directly. We want them to do better, but it doesn't necessarily take root in our own psyche and therefore promote us to do different actions or interact with them differently. So empathy, is required for absolutely everything that we do as people and as technologists. So everything from what is the user experience like when someone makes use of our software? What is the developer experience like when someone takes our code and attempts to extend it or build on top of it? Um, what is it that actually creates an understanding of the needs of others when we are creating something? And if we don't have the understanding of what other people are trying to gain from their interactions with us or with our code, we're not going to meet their needs. We're not going to be able to pull them into our community as contributors. We're not going to be able to effectively interface with them because we aren't meeting them where they are and making sure that what they're provided is useful to them. 
people are happy to engage with other people that they like, but as Denise pointed out in her keynote, at the end of the day, it's about producing quality technology that we can all make use of whilst we are connecting together as human beings. And of course, it starts all with you. So you have to practice some kind of way to get into um, empathy. Because empathy is not necessarily a given. So you are not born empathetic. Well, it differs. But um, empathy is something that you can definitely learn. It is a skill that you can learn, that you can practice. And it's all about you and knowing yourself. How do I think? How do I react in certain situations? How do I feel about things? Might it be the dog on the street? Do I like dogs? Have I been bitten by a dog when I was a child? Am I afraid of dogs? Something like this. And also to express your feelings. And most of the time, your inner feelings guide your thoughts. So if I have been bitten by a dog when I was a child, my inner feelings tell me, dog, dangerous. So I will probably take a step back. So that is how I will react. If you have not been bitten by a dog, if you only met nice dogs who never barked at you and who were very friendly, shaking their, their butt, right? Um, <laughs> you will probably say, oh, doggy, hey, can I pet you? Right? And there is, it shows that there is a difference by your past experience. And it's also a difference by the audience that surround you. So it's probably, you're probably acting differently when you're amongst your peers or your family or when you're on the board meeting or even when you're talking to a customer. We have several hats that we can put on. We have several roles that we work, uh, that, we, that we play, kind of, but it's still you. And people who are empathetic tend to be better negotiators because they try to find a common ground, some kind of common ground for everyone. Can I just add something to that? Oh, yes, please. Yeah, so one of the things that I think is uh, incredibly important when talking to different audiences with different experiences, again, practicing empathy, is really driving home the point that empathy is not just about with whom you are trying to communicate. It really is about you. Um, there are some people who don't necessarily feel that kindness in communication or what we refer to as soft skills um, are really important, really, and, and fundamentally to them, it's all about the code or the work product, and the path to get there uh, is, not, is not significant to them. And, you know, I, I can understand that perspective, but fundamentally, uh, if you want to be able to make that pie bigger, if you want to be able to have people come along with you and work beside you and help you to improve the things that you care about, you're not going to be able to do this if you are not... Uh, concerned with their needs as well. Like, you can't just expect people to show up and do it all your way. It won't be effective. So if you're one of those people who thinks those squishy human things are not necessarily for you, we really want to encourage you to think about the use of empathy in your interactions with others because it will be of benefit to you as well, and you can get more of what you want. So this is not just be nice to everybody. It's also be nice to everybody so you're being nice to yourself. Yes. So uh, one thing that I think is very important is to realize that empathy is actually a choice. It is a choice that we make every day to be empathetic or not. You know, as Diana pointed out earlier, uh, Diana is not something that we are innately, uh, empathy is not something we're innately born with, right? It is a learned skill. And there have been um, several very interesting uh, studies done in the last couple of years about empathy and how it can be cultivated in people. And these studies turned up two points that I'd like to make. One is that uh, people, when given a choice, will not do things that they think will cause them to feel empathy when they feel that will give them a, a greater emotional or cognitive burden. So in this particular study, they were given a choice of how they wanted to arrive at a particular destination. And one way was through a neighborhood where there was great poverty, 
um, and where uh, the, the chances that you would observe that great poverty were higher. And one direction was through, you know, a beautiful city center with museums and, you know, wonderful artistic things. And the, the beautiful route was much longer, about five minutes longer. Most people chose to take the longer route, and when asked about it, it wasn't the beautiful buildings or the opportunity to see the museum, it was just that they, they felt like seeing the poverty in the city would, would be harmful to them, it would make them sad, so they simply avoided it. Which means, again, empathy is a choice that we exercise. So if we can choose to be empathetic, and not just you know, feel like, well, I'm, I'm not good at this, so I just won't you know, worry about it, then, again, we all have the opportunity to improve in this regard. And the other uh, key facet of this study was the ability to prime people to feel empathy. So the next stage of the research was for uh, the research team to work with this group of individuals and to tell them stories that illustrated the exercising of empathy, everything from... Um, a stranger meets someone who, uh, this is a, an old tale in so many cultures, a stranger meets someone who doesn't have a coat and offers their coat to this stranger and creates a better world by doing this and sharing, to um, you know, other tales of uh, people helping one another and being kind to one another. And once this, the research subjects had heard these stories and then they were given a test about what choices they would make in a given situation, they all scored much higher towards empathetic reactions to other people because their brains had been trained with the idea that empathy produces positive results. So if we know that this is something that is you know, a choice and can be trained, um, I guess what I'm trying to say in a very long-winded way is nobody gets a free pass to be a jerk because they think they can't be nice to other people. Like, it's, if it's your choice whether or not you want to be kind, welcoming, and gracious, but don't tell me you can't do it. I've heard people tell me they just can't do it. And to you, I say you are fibbing. It's just not, it's just not the case. <laughs> and speaking of skill, so it is not an innate skill. So you can learn it, as Leslie said. And uh, you can learn it, for example, by being reflective. What does that mean? Well, you basically just think about the actions that you have, that you do, the inter interactions with other humans. And um, I will give you a little example of how I learned to be more empathetic. I was not born like this, so I had to work on that. Um, what I did was I took 30 minutes, sometimes just 15 minutes a day. I sat down at the end of the day, I wrote down the interactions that might be a bit difficult for me, and I wrote down, what did I say? And I reflected on, what did I feel at that time? And what did the other person say? And what could I have said that this interaction would not have been so difficult for the both of us or for the people around me? So you have to first learn yourself, as I said, and then try to communicate with others because we are not we are not living in a vacuum. We are living with other human beings around us, and uh, find some trusted human beings and uh, try to learn in baby steps, and talk to them about um, things like, "Whoa, what you what you just said hurt my feelings. I can't really say why, but let us discuss about this or something like this." And empathy is often built through adversity. When you go through stress time, you, you really know who is empathetic around you. So just because things are coming easy to you does not mean that, they, that these things come easy to everyone. And I can tell you, words matter. So if you are, for example, coaching um, a junior, and you say words like, you just have to, it's obviously this and that, um, you diminish their knowledge. You, you're not really um, empowering them to do it yourself, uh, themselves, right? And to give you another example, which I really, really like, so I have to tell it, uh, I saw a talk some years back by a blind person. Obviously, there it is, I say it too, I'm sorry. Um, so I am, I am not, I, I'm not blind. I, I can tell you I'm not blind, I can see you, I can see colors. This person was blind and he couldn't see colors. And it was back in the days when the first iPhone app came out that can tell the colors of things. So he was very excited over the day, he got this app and he wanted to go uh, home and try this app. 
So he went home at the end of the day. It was in the mid, mid of winter. He was living in Great Britain, so it was dark. And he went home and he tried this app. He tried it on his shirt and it said black. He tried it on his desk. It said black. He tried it on several other things and it said black. And he was like, that can't be. And then he was thinking, okay, um, colors, colors. What's, what's going on with colors? Ooh, I need light. Otherwise, it will not distinguish the colors, right? So um, he went, switched on the light, and then he tried uh, his app again and said, blue, red, orange, yellow. And he was like, whoo, I learned something today. So he was empathetic in the other way. So what, that, what I want to say about this is you have to step out of your comfort zone and try to find out what the other comfort zone is. And what that means is not only think about it, but as I said, talk to people. So another way to, to cultivate empathy within yourself is to practice a skill called active listening. So active listening is a concept that came out of the nonviolent communications framework, which was used to, uh, in the Middle East peace process in the 70s. And the idea of uh, active listening is to ensure that the people engaged in your conversation know not only that you have heard what they've said, but that you have internalized it and that what they have said to you matters to you. And you can do this very simply. We'll do a quick demonstration. Diana, would you like to have some dinner? Um, yeah, I feel a bit like sushi. Okay, so sushi. So I don't eat fish, so oh. do you think they have teriyaki dishes at the sushi place? Yes, I'm pretty sure they have teriyaki dishes. I okay, perfect. And also usually they'll have tempura. Okay, great. So I'm hearing dinner. Let's find a sushi place. Uh, is there one you prefer or should we look it up online? I think we can look it up online. I'm okay. not familiar with this. Here. Great, excellent. Okay, so, so I'll go ahead and get out my phone and there we go. We have just had an active listening conversation. I have demonstrated to Diana that I've heard that she wants food. I've heard that she wants a particular type of food. I've brought my concerns to the table as well, saying I'm not someone who eats fish. Will there be something available for me? She said, absolutely. And then therefore, great, we have dinner plans. Now, so that's a very simple example, but the practice of active listening is about mirroring the communications that you're seeing from the other parties in the dialogue. So this can be everything from changing your body language, which we do more or less consciously, that's called mirroring. So if I'm talking to Diana and we're both hanging out together, we usually end up like this. It happens. Um, and also by repeating back to the uh, other person in our dialogue what they've said, but in our own words, we've shown that we've internalized it and that we were actually listening. Um, how many people have seen the movie Fight Club Okay, do you remember that great scene where the, uh, the main characters are at a support group and uh, the girl says, most people are just waiting for their turn to talk, not really listening? Active listening is about showing that you're not just waiting for your turn to talk, that the other person in the dialogue matters to you. And you rephrase it some, somehow so it's your words and not theirs because if you just repeat their words they will say yeah yeah you understand me but sometimes you do not and no one wants to talk to a robot would you like to get <laughs> would you like to get dinner yes I would like to get dinner like that's that's not what we're talking about right like you know engage in dialogue bring your whole self but you know again make sure that you're bringing your whole self to listen to what the other person has to say yeah and there's, there's another very very important thing where you can uh, actually practice empathy without interacting with other humans. This is my favorite way of practicing empathy, mostly because I was that little nerd child in the corner with a book all the time, not talking to the other human beings because human beings are scary. So you can cultivate empathy in yourself simply through the act of reading fiction. Fiction is an excellent opportunity to understand people's motivations, how the characters interact, and it's different from viewing uh, a fictive work or, you know, my favorite shows on Netflix or whatever, because my imagination is going to fill out whatever detail the author of the work has not included. So I am able to envision a character and perhaps it's clear to me that since this person is very arrogant, they always wear purple because they think they're very special, like royalty. Or perhaps, um, you know, someone who's very nervous drinks a lot of coffee very quickly, right? 
being able to have that mental image that accompanies the story is actually a practice of empathy because you are forced to understand these characters, their motivations, how they present themselves in the world. What exactly is it that makes them tick? And by going through that process, you can learn about how other human beings do that because unless you're reading spec fic, which, you know, has its place, uh, you know, the great works of literature the world over are about teaching us how people are motivated, why they do the things that they do. And this is, this is useful knowledge for us when we're out in the real world talking to real people and not just turning page after page. I have a great example for that. Um, can I have a show of hands if you know Harry Potter, if you read Harry Potter? All right, there was a discussion about, I don't know, one or two years ago about a movie of Harry Potter where Hermione would be played by a, a, a colored girl. And everyone was so enraged because they said, how can that be? No, 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 no. And uh, Joan K. Rowling came up and said, no, 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 I never mentioned Hermione's skin. I mentioned she had curly hair, she had big teeth, all of the things. I never, I never really mentioned her skin. So it was our imagination that had this Hermione character put on the Hermione character of the movies, for example. So there were people out there who were really, 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 really scared, I think, of the um, prospect of being Hermione Granger with colored skin. So. And, and that, again, that's the, that, the power of our imagination and being able to place ourselves in that story. And then think about this as well. People are so afraid and so threatened that the picture that they have built in their head of a particular fictitious universe will be disturbed that it causes public outcry, which is fascinating to me. Yes, totally. So um, what I wanted to say with that is actually stay curious. You know, as a kid, we wanted to explore everything. We wanted to know, what does this button do? Why do I don't have to, uh, why do I have to keep away from the sockets? And stuff like this. But as a uh, grown-up, not so much. But you should be curious about all the things, especially about the human beings around you. And uh, because, ho hopefully, none of you is a mind reader, uh, we are usually not a mind reader. We can't say, um, okay, you are doing this because of that, that, that. Um, and that is an assumption. And I can tell you, assumptions are evil. Really, I've been there, I've done that, I have uh, fallen into the well where I assumed something, and I was literally smacked on the head and said, nope. I mean, I don't say, don't assume anything because we are humans. <laughs> of course, we assume things because that is how we build. But um, ask questions. Talk to the people. Communication is the key. And by questions, I don't mean closed questions where you can only answer with yes or no. Do you like blue? Yes. Something like this? No. Use open question. In German, we only have W questions, so that's pretty easy, but in English, we also have H questions. So we have what, why, how, for example. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Invite the people to communicate with you. So basically, those open questions are your friends. And I, I think it's also a, a critical thing when we think about the exercise of empathy to realize that there are so many times that we go into a situation with people where we feel that there may be conflict and we have already decided how the other person feels. Clearly so-and-so doesn't like me or they wouldn't have made that post to the mailing list. Obviously this person thinks I'm an idiot, look at what they said in my last code review. You know, obviously we're not gonna get along because you know, this person has uh, different thoughts about politics than I do. And again, those assumptions are evil. We have no idea how another person feels or what their life experience is like if we don't ask them. We can make some basic assumptions like, I see you are awake. Excellent. Probably you're ready to communicate since you're ready, to, you know, since you're awake and you have a coffee in your hand. So, you know, good signals. But we cannot just make assumptions about how people feel, think, or how they'll act because of our own fear or any concerns we have on our part. We need to set those fears aside in order to effectively, again, bring our whole selves to the dialogue. And did you hear the words? Obviously, just did I do clearly, that? yes. I am when a you, bad when, person. No, when you when you when you, <laughs> do, when you did the negative uh, uh, examples, so Ooh. that's that's totally fine. I too shall fail. <laughs> it will be fine. No. <laughs> so, uh, again, if you're going to create an environment of empathy, 
you need to be very explicit about your values and inclusive in those values. And what I mean by inclusive in those values is you need to make it very clear why everyone is there together working on a common problem, what are the goals that you're all trying to achieve, and what are your non-goals? Like, what, who are the people or the ideas that will not be well served by interacting in this company, organization, open source project? And don't just assume that because you're all friends working on something together, that as, as time goes by and your project matures, that that will be enough, right? This unwritten lore that we tend to rely upon in open source projects and think that everyone will understand why decisions are made this way or how decisions get made or how to influence or persuade within the project, it's, it's not something that everyone understands and that it can end up being exclusionary if we don't make explicit what our values are and what our cultural history is because people don't necessarily innately understand the in-jokes or the, the lore of the group, right? We need to make it very clear what those stories are, what the project values are, and why we want people to show up and interact with us. And I think that this is equally important for open source projects as it is for companies. So depending upon what your, you know, the, the values of your company are beyond making a profit, you, know, you need to make those explicit. Uh, one of the companies that I think is, is a, a great model in this is ThoughtWorks. Anyone in the audience from ThoughtWorks? Okay, well, we wish you the very best wherever you folks are. Um, so on uh, ThoughtWorks website, there is actually a page discussing how the company will work f towards social justice. And the way that they are defining social justice is to help to empower uh, groups of people who don't have as much access to technology with more technology by having their employees have as part of their uh, paid work time the ability to do community-oriented events that are educational to everyone in the community, whether or not they are somehow commercially affiliated with ThoughtWorks. And they also dedicate uh, developer time and resources to working on projects that are of social benefit, such as uh, open source health systems. And they not only make this value explicit within their company, that they care about making the world a better place on top of wanting to make a profit. They put it on their externally facing website so every single customer, every single person who potentially wants to have a commercial engagement with them understands that these are fundamental values that ThoughtWorks supports and that they will put their time, energy, and resources towards it. And that, are also, that is an explicit invitation for you to engage with them if these values mirror your own, right? They've made it very clear what they're there for. They're not just there to write code, they're also there to make the world a better place according to these guidelines. I didn't have anything else interesting to say. Slide. Okay, good. Um, as a, uh, let's go there. Okay, cool. So, <laughs> discourage hippoing. I shall define hippo. For those in the audience not familiar with the term, uh, the idea of hippoing is that the highest paid person's opinion is the only one that matters. So it's not this delightful creature that you see before you. It's actually uh, not a cool thing. So it's not the manager that stands in front of you and says you uh, and tells you what to do and uh, what not to do. It is actually, if you are the hippo in the room, please make sure that every, wo every voice is heard so that people have a voice. As a hippo, I can tell you, it is energy draining, it is a lot of work, it is uh, a lot of mind work that goes into that. So when you're in a meeting uh, with 10 people and you have to take care of all of those 10 people, you have an agenda and everyone wants to say something, so everyone should have the opportunity to say something. We all know those people who um, are very laid back and who do not speak their mind very often. So if you are the manager, the hippo, on, uh, in, this man in this meeting, make sure to have an eye contact with everyone and ask them if they want to do this. So I have, I have this friend, I have, to, I have to tell you this, I'm working with him on volunteer pr projects for quite some time, and when we're in a meeting, he does this. All those nervous, nervous things. And you know, he's warming up to say something. And then some, somebody else needs to, needs, to do, needs to take the role and say, hey, I can see you, you have something to say. It looks like you have something to say. What do you want to say? And then finally, he comes out with all the things that he wanted to say. 
But he did not speak over, over the others because that's, that's not how he is. And also make pauses for people to think. Silence is actually good. If you are talking all the time over and over again, there are people that, who cannot follow the, the, the whole communication. Stay quiet for a moment. Also in a conf call. Silence is good. People have to think. Make sure that people have the opportunity to think. And uh, the other thing that I think is very uh, important as a takeaway from this principle is that uh, good leaders tend to think that all they need to do is say, everyone's opinion is welcome. And we want everyone to share their ideas and we have an open door policy. And while they may actually mean those things, and those things are true for them, most people have been socialized due to their past experience that when you hear those words, they are empty words and that they are not actually true. So I don't, I, I, I've been in many jobs where I was told there was an open door policy and typically when I went through the open door, I left thinking that the door was gonna hit me in the behind on the way out. Um, not a very positive experience. So over time, I've learned to be much more careful in what I say and how I articulate my ideas in, in group settings until I've gotten to know everyone really well and understand that it really is an environment of psychological safety. So if you're uh, in, a, in a leadership position in a project, at a company, if you're a highly paid CEO, if you are you know, the lead maintainer on a project, don't just say to everybody, you know, I wanna know what you think. Because these people probably, oh, we hope, like you. They don't wanna tell you something they think will disappoint you. You need to open the dialogue by, by, for example, pointing out something that you don't like or making it very clear that you yourself have made mistakes in order for people to feel, again, an environment of psychological safety so that they can challenge that highest person's opinion, highest paid person's opinion or the person with the highest status in the room. So don't flip the bozo bit. Um, anybody heard the term bozo bit? Okay, cool, there are a few people in the audience. So uh, the term bozo bit was brought to us in uh, 1995 by a gentleman named Jim McCarthy in his book, The Dynamics of Software Development, uh, which is still an excellent uh, book to read even if it has uh, gotten a as old as I am. Actually, I'm older, let's not tell anyone. So the idea of the bozo bit is that somebody uh, within your team or organization has done something so silly and egregious that you've flipped the bozo bit, like no matter what, you think this person is a clown, nothing they say is valuable, you just kind of, you know, you ignore them and all that you say and do, you work around them rather than trying to work with them. And the unfortunate thing about us uh, as human beings flipping the bozo bit is it, is it is harmful to us and it is harmful to the person upon whom the bit has been flipped. Now, I'm not saying there are not situations in which uh, a moment makes you realize that perhaps this is not the place for this person to collaborate with you and your team. That's fine, that's a different conversation to have. But if you're in an environment where you have someone working with you and you actively route around them constantly, you're wasting your time, you're wasting their time, you're creating an extremely uncomfortable situation for everyone who's observing this behavior. And fundamentally, you've created a situation in which this person who's had the bit flipped on them can't succeed. People are smart enough to know when someone has lost faith in them. And typically, if a person has made a mistake and it's a very big mistake, shame will cause them to continue making more mistakes because they're afraid, because they are quite certain that their next step will be a mistake, and typically they're right, right? Insecurity begins to take over in our mind and cause us to make poor decisions. Um, and, it's equal, and again, it's also harmful for the person who's doing the bit flipping because you're cutting yourself off from the opportunity to learn from this person, and even if it's just learning how to work with someone you find to be difficult, right? You have cut yourself off from the opportunity to engage deeply with something that is uncomfortable for you, right? Everyone has a bad day, everyone makes mistakes. Deciding that forever and always this person is not someone with whom you're going to spend your time or your goodwill just is, is harmful to everyone around. If, if you need to have a discussion about people parting ways, then have that discussion, but don't, don't sit in collaborative spaces with people feeling that you, know, you just really wish you weren't there because it's obvious to them, it's obvious to other people, and it just generally creates a really poor environment, and again, it lacks empathy. And there we come to the next point. Make it truly okay to fail. As I said earlier, we are humans. We are flawed, seriously. So we make mistakes, 
And sometimes we make really, 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 really big mistakes. Because we, we push software into the market that is not ready yet, and a lot of customers have a really, really bad day, for example. It does not help to flip the bozo, as Leslie said, right? So try to build a structure of candor. Candor is a new word that I learned just recently, and which I like very, very, very much, because it means be open, be a uh, have constructive feedback, have a communication culture to talk about this. And also do retrospectives instead of postmortems. Yes, a lot of customers had a really, really, really bad day, but nobody probably died. So let's think about what went wrong. We have a process. This and this and this happened. Why, do, that, why did we have this outcome? And then Let's work from there. I have a little uh, exercise that I do with my uh, team every end of uh, every project. We do a retrospective, of course. And then at the end of the retrospective, we do the appreciation game. Everyone says something positive about someone else. And again, as the hippo in the room, I have to make sure that everyone had the chance to say something positive and that everyone did receive something positive. Why do I do that? To get my team closer together. To not only uh, focus on all the negative things that went wrong, but also to see what we as accomplished as a team. Because everyone knows that one negative thing stands out so much against a lot of positive things. And it helps my team to bond, and it helps everyone to stay motivated, to just say, yes, we can do that. The next project will be even more awesome. And again, I, I introduced the term earlier in the talk, psychological safety, but just to, to put a little bit of context around that. So once upon a time, I worked at Google, and uh, I had the opportunity to observe firsthand their hiring process, which could be called rigorous, kindly. Um, and, you know, there was, there was a lot of uh, kerfuffle within the organization because what they really wanted to do was understand what it was to, that made uh, particular engineers at their organization extremely successful because they wanted to make sure they were hiring the right people. So they were hoping to, to find uh, common patterns so that they could, you know, always just make the right choice on um, who to hire, you know. So again, data-driven company, they sifted through data and, you know, trying to understand, was it a particular university? Was it a particular programming language that you first learned? Was it the age at which you got your first computer? And, you know, was it, was it the impact of your manager and how your manager treated you? Like, what is it that, that created a success for an engineer at Google? And uh, people were very surprised to come back and report that what the data bore out was not that it was a particular background, it wasn't going to an elite university, it wasn't because your manager was very experienced, it was that the team that you are on was one in which it was truly okay to fail. There was an environment of psychological safety because people knew that if they said something silly or they made a mistake, they weren't going to have the bozo bit flipped on them. They knew they could make mistakes, and because they knew they could make mistakes, they were much more willing to share ideas that they had that seemed impossible or outlandish or poorly formed, but had the seed of something great within it. And that was the number one determining factor for an engineer's success, was that the environment that they were in was one in which it was okay to fail, and it wasn't just words, oh, everyone makes mistakes. It was repeatedly demonstrated by the team's leadership and by their peers that mistakes were not costly, mistakes were just simply a part of showing up. Yes. And just to um, summarize our talk. Um, so we, we call this the, we'll tell you what we'll tell you, then we tell you, then we'll tell you what we've told you. So um, again, empathy is a choice and a learnable skill, and we can cultivate it through the processes of active listening, through reading fiction, um, taking the time to get to know yourself and to deepen your self-awareness, and to practice curiosity in your daily life and to avoid assumptions because they are evil. And I like to conclude this talk with a uh, quote by Ian McLaren. Be kind, for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Leslie and Diana. Uh, just, can we, can just we have a, one second? Just a second. So we're going to exercise empathy now on stage, which is a hard thing to do, but we're going to do it together. I am German. I am not from the US, so I uh, would like to apologize to um, the, the people of color. I just learned that colored people is a very offensive word. I did not know that. I am very sorry. And I am very proud of you for taking the opportunity to apologize on stage because I know how frightening that is. And this is one of the reasons why I love you so much. I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Thank you. This is why she's my daughter's godmother. Any questions, folks? There's a question, yeah. There, oh, there are more questions. Thank you for the great talk. I had so many things I want to ask, but I'm going to stick to one because I'm sure a lot of people in this room are or know someone who is in, my wife, for example, is in a company that are not doing so many of these things, mm -hmm. and I see how much it frustrates her. Um, so for those people who are in companies where they are not the hippo, um, and they see so many problems they want to solve, but don't have the power to do so, how do you recommend that they try and affect those changes? So that's, a, that's an excellent question. Um, do you want to take that, or shall I pontificate? I would like to start. Excellent. Find an ally. <laughs> Find uh, as many allies as you can. Hopefully, also, one of the allies is a level higher than you. And then try to change within. It is really hard work. It is really hard work to find allies. And it's really hard work to change an organization from within if, uh, if there are only a handful of people. But it is doable, but it takes time. Because as humans, we tend to stick to the post that we are, have. We tend to stick to the processes that we have. So we need to be grabbed and shown that it is good to do things. Yeah. Uh, I'm absolutely in agreement about uh, the finding of an ally. The other thing that I would, um, so there's, there's a couple of different ways to think about this. One is um, if you're looking around within the organization and trying to find allies and you don't find those allies, um, it, it may very well be that this is not a good match for you and your personal value system. And it's, it's okay to walk away from situations like that. You don't have to fix it. So yes. just, I know that there are a lot of people who want to make the world a better place, myself included, and I have spent many cycles of my life trying to fix things that really just didn't need to be fixed. I just needed to not be there watching it happen. <laughs> so that's always okay. Um, the other thing to, to think about is, uh, you know, most uh, businesses are supportive of their employees setting up uh, informal affinity groups like communities of practice within their organization. And, you know, having an informal group of folks who, uh, you know, hang out in the office over lunch once a month and talk about like how can we all be better together and you know identifying common problems that's great that's an excellent first step particularly if it's not you know about being like critical to the business or critical to an individual just like you know we've noticed that employee retention is low we have high turnover maybe we should think about what, what the root causes are for that and then finally if you're having um, issues with your management layer um, you know if you are brave and really you know, feel like you want to fix it, come with this list of, of common problems and the business drivers for change. So you know, if people are really unhappy because there isn't an environment of psychological safety, talking about how a more inclusive dialogue in the workplace will help to increase retention because of any number of studies, I'd be happy to send your wife. Um, and this is going to save us money because we don't have to keep doing retraining. That can sometimes spark the positive change that any number of seemingly logical conversations about why can't we just be kind to each other don't necessarily spark in folks. There I, wait, no, 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 there's a baby. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I know, but there's a question in the middle. Okay, well. And then, then the baby. The mama. Yes. I think, I can't see back that far. Maybe it's the daddy. It's, it's, it's the mama. It's okay, the mama, cool. good. All right. Okay, uh, thank you very much for your talk. It's awesome and we need more of talks like this. Uh, so my question is actually a little bit similar to the previous, but it's from a different angle, so I think it's worth to ask it. Uh, I think that uh, you're kind of preaching to the choir here, and people Probably. in this yes. room really care about empathy, but uh, I, I have an impression that it's an assumption I'm making, sorry, that many developers are kind of like empathy deniers, I, I know because I was an empathy denier once, and I thought that all these squishy bits don't matter, and it's just like we just talk logically, and it's going to be great. Uh, so 
my question is, in your experience, how do you talk about empathy to empathy deniers? Like, what works to get people to see that there is something there, actually, that they should care about? I got this. All right. So this goes back to our early slide about this is about you too, right? So this is about encouraging folks to think about the problem in terms of enlightened self-interest. Okay. So maybe uh, I am convinced that as a you know as a senior developer that I am you know completely logical and rational, and of course you know I don't have to worry about that squishy human stuff. That's fine. But if you can show to these people that a failure to have consideration for the perspectives of perspective of others is harming their work, that can often be very persuasive. So, um, Kate, so your error messages are non-descriptive. How many more bug reports are you getting because your error messages are non-descriptive and they make total sense to you? And of course, it's completely logical that you'll say like, code error 517,024 so does not compile, like, which means absolutely nothing to anyone but you, right? Like, you could have a smaller issue queue if you just wrote more human readable error messages, for example. And that's, it's not necessarily a great example, but again, what is the impact to that individual for failing to exercise empathy? And once people start going like, oh, you mean I can make my pie bigger, my issue queue smaller, and like have a better day, then you know, people who tend to be kind of, you know, empathy deniers, you know, get on the train and you know, come along with us. And I'm actually, I would like to reverse and ask you, how did you go from being an empathy denier to, to being here with all of us today? And we, are, we welcome you to our pod of people who care about empathy. <laughs> he doesn't. Uh-huh. Okay, so I'm just going to summarize that really quickly for the, be the benefit of the, the, the camera not having uh, the ability to hear you as well. So apparently the rationality movement, uh, when folks got together and, and started thinking through things logically, they discovered that if they were uh, more focused on the human problems, they were actually going to have better success in solving things that they thought were logically based. Is that a fair summary? We'll take it. Okay. Okay. So, so be, being empathic for the next speaker, oh. uh, last question, short yes. answer. Short yes. answer. Yes. So actually, my question ties in very well with the last question, um, which is just what set you on the path to now think and advocate for empathy? Wow. Oh, that's I don't want to answer one. that question. <laughs> oh, okay. Uh, I, I can answer this question. Um, I can tell you that people who come from a difficult background, like a really difficult background, tend to care more about humans. But, of, but because they come from a difficult background, they did not learn to uh, take care of other people. They um, did not learn how to initiate uh, empathy. And so my path was... I would like to help people, but I have no idea how, because I did not learn it when I was young because of my difficult background. So that was my, my train that got me into, into the role, and also um, bad role models. Yeah. So as I said, toxic environment, toxic managers, and I have one manager that I always pull up in my mind and say, okay, I will do exactly the opposite. Yeah. Um, I would like to just say that I learned reductively as well that empathy is a very positive thing to have, and uh, I lacked it in my youth. I wanted to make sure that I didn't uh, create an environment where I felt, when I myself was there, felt like I had no power and no agency, uh, because it felt very bad to me, and I didn't ever want anyone else to be in that position, so if there was a way that I could help them not be there, then I was going to do it. Yes. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.